As this is probably my last episode, I feel it's time we talked about the beginning of the world. At the beginning, there was nothing. That's how stuff tends to begin. Then there was shadow and light. Shadow became the world of Nilfheimer, aka the world of cold and ice and darkness. Nilfheimer also had diverse poisonous rivers flowing out of it, rivers which slowly froze over to give you poisonous ice. It was a nice place. Light became the world of Muspelheimer, which sounds better, but soon became a roaring volcano, full of fire and lava and molten stone, and more generally, things burning. And in the middle, between Nilfheimer and Muspelheimer, there was Ginunga Gap, which for the sake of clarity, we'll call the Gap. Mind the Gap meant something in those days. The Gap was a gaping hole between the two first worlds, and the place where nothing would become something. In the middle of the gap, you found lots of nothing, and a bit of poisonous ice, and a bit of lava. When you pour lava on something, it tends to melt. So, in due respect of the laws of physics, the ice melted, and, in due disrespect of the laws of physics, it didn't become water again, but became Umir, the first of all creatures. Umir didn't do much with his life. He was the lowest life form that was, really, a bit like snails. Actually, Umir did have a link with snails, as his name means the hermaphrodite. And snails are hermaphrodites, as I'm sure you know. I mean, who hasn't been into snail sex at some point in their life? Umir is actually close to Ima, the first mortal of Hindu mythology, and his name has the same root as the Latin word Geminus, which is linked to the astrology word Gemini, the double, the twin, the two-gendered. While Umir lay there, a cow appeared. The origins of the cow aren't very clear. It seems it was also melting ice that just happened to give a cow instead of giving a giant. Just goes to show, doesn't it? Now, the cow was called Aud Humla. From it, four rivers of milk came out to feed the giant Umir, who, although he just lay around doing nothing, still needed someone to look after him. That's how we know he was a bloke. Now, in most mythologies, people are born out of eggs or legs, or sometimes heads in Athena's case, but Umir managed a feat no one else has equaled since. He gave birth through his sweat. Now, lying next to lava means you get hot easily, and Umir managed to sweat a boy and a girl out of his armpits, and a few extra kids from the sticky parts between his toes. On a side note, an Earth primal god is common, but most often they are female. Think of Gaia in the Greek mythology, for example. And water is an element which is usually linked to women, across all myths, and Norse myths in particular. For example, Valkyries bring drinks to warriors in the Valhurn, and as we've seen before, a kenning for woman is drink-bearer. Powerful goddesses are often born of water. Again, if you look into the Greek myths, Aphrodite comes out of spray. So it's interesting that Umir, through sweat and earth, represents female principles, although he's supposed to be male and female simultaneously. While Umir was busy sweating out the first giants, the cow Adhumla was busy licking the ice. She saw something that looked like grass and licked the ice off it to eat it, and was very disappointed to find it was hair. Because she was a good cow, she still licked the head, then the shoulders, then the whole body, until there was no ice left around Buri. Now, it would have been simpler if Adhumla had just uncovered Othin straight away, because we're all just waiting for Othin at the moment. But Buri was actually Othin's grandfather. You still had to wait until Buri had a son, without, it seems, much help from a wife. His son chose himself a wife, and with her, he had three sons. Othin, who would become the old father and the king of the gods, Vili and Ve. Vili and Ve aren't mentioned in any myths except the creation myth, so one dreads to think what Othin did with them in the meantime. And Othin said to his brothers, isn't Umir a waste of space? And to be fair, he was. So they killed him and spread him across the world. They used his flesh for the earth, his hairs for the grass, his bones for the mountains, his blood for the rivers and lakes. Vili asked, what shall we do with his teeth? And Othin said, just throw them around the place. And that's how we got boulders and stones scattered across the land. Ve asked, what shall we do with his brains? And Othin said, put them in the sky. And that's how we got clouds. When people ask me what I see when I look at a cloud, I always answer bits of a giant's brain. 
Because the sky was full of brains, it wasn't holding up in the air very well, and it kept falling back on the earth. So Othin took four dwarves and got them to hold the sky up, and the dwarves were called Ostri, Vestri, Northri, and Suthri, which means east, west, north, and south. And so humans, who are the least original creatures in the world, say they're going to see Ostri when they're going east, and Northri when they're going north, and so on. Othin looked at the world and thought, this looks cosy, and it took less than seven days to make. Talking of days... We're nearly done, he said out loud. But you know what's missing? Like most gods, he only asked rhetorical questions, so he answered himself before his brothers could. We need time. And the good news was, there was this guy named Mudil Fari, which means he who makes time. Often knows where he popped out from, he just appeared while these guys were busy making the Nine Worlds. Collateral damage, if you would. He was the father of Sol and Moni, the sun and the moon. So the sun and the moon were appointed their places in the sky, and the stars were made out of some of Muspelheimer's fire. And by going through the sky on their chariots, sun and moon made days, and nights, and hours, and time. And that was basically it. There was lots of work left to do, building the nine worlds in detail and making other species of gods like the Vanir and the Ezir, but the myths don't bother with all that, because the most important part of the story was getting useless Umir to do something with his life, which Othin succeeded in doing, as he got Umir to make the whole world out of it. Hi guys, hoped you liked this episode. As I mentioned at the start, this is probably the last myth I'll post for a while. This doesn't mean I'll stop the channel completely. I've got really cool projects, which will be a visual novel involving the Norse gods, and I'm planning to rewrite the Lokasena as a rap battle. But I need time to do it, and posting a vid every two weeks is a lot of work, which I don't think I can keep up for another year. So I'll take a break for a while, but I'll keep in touch via Facebook, and I'm hoping I can get the rap battle out there at the end of November, so if you subscribe, you'll get to see that. In the meantime, thanks for having followed me this far. Cheers!